Um, the topic that we have chosen today, uh, while it's been introduced as shared value, uh, what we like to call it over here at Save the Children is building transformational partnerships for social good. Um, so I think uh, in the morning plenary, we talked a lot about fundamental disruptions that are changing the social landscape. Um, so we know that historical problems such as um, social problems, such as lack of uh, access to quality education, to um, health and well-being services for the, for the developing world, um, to climate, uh, problems of climate change are problems that are existing and are, we are aware about. But now what we are really seeing is an emerging world where there are uh, problems which are cutting across geographies. So displacement, conflicts, and migrations are affecting the global uh, changing landscape. And whom do we look for to resolve these problems? Essentially, the responsibility lies on the state and government. But I think increasingly, of course, with the SDGs as well, um, there is this growing realization that without multi-sector collaborations, without private sector really uh, taking on uh, that uh, responsibility, these problems will not be solved. Um, and businesses, therefore, are, are really uh, starting to think from being transactional, which is just uh, uh, philanthropy and cutting a check and giving it to NGOs or to uh, other organizations to resolve these problems, are uh, moving on to being transformational. Um, and partnerships between NGOs such as us, Save the Children and Businesses, are trying to harness the real essence of a business, be it networks, be it their assets, or be it their technical expertise. And this cannot be done without really thinking afresh and innovating. And introduce that topic, I would like to invite Louisiana here from SCUS, who would possibly talk a lot more about that. Mm -hmm. Great. So in terms of innovation, innovation can come from within, it can come from outside the organization, it can also um, be co-created, these new ideas on how are we going to solve these problems. At Save the Children, we have realized that while we had been innovating for quite a long time, there were many ideas we were not capturing and we were not finding ways to bring those ideas up to, to, to get more attention and try to bring them to scale. I think many of us as nonprofits are sometimes worried about trying new things because when you try something new, there is a potential that you may fail, that that idea may not actually quite work out. And we're all trying to be very efficient with how we use our funding. Um, so that idea of risk is, uh, is a little bit concerning. Um, but we did establish an innovation hub. And what I think is really important about this hub is that we really have these innovation scouts that are looking at trying to identify and put the spotlight on ideas that some of our own colleagues are trying out, out in the field. So it's not us at headquarters thinking about what may be a good idea. It's what our colleagues in Bangladesh, in Kenya, in India, working at the field are identifying as good ideas that we should try out. Um, so really excited about that in terms of us looking for innovations uh, from within. I also want to talk about an example with uh, Philips, Royal Philips, and I did not know until I walked in today that they actually had a table outside, so I don't know if they're in the room and listening, but we do have a great example of innovation with Philips. Um, when you think about it, of course, this partnership needs to have a common objective that makes sense for both organizations. Save the children, of course, because you can tell because of our name, we care about saving children, we care about the survival and their well-being. Philips, being a technology company with a particular interest in um, digital solutions for health as well, uh, we had a, a, a very good reason to come together. When you look at the reasons why children die under the age of five, the main reason, the main um, infectious disease that is killing children is pneumonia. Why are they dying from pneumonia is mostly because it is being misdiagnosed. And why is that? Is because when you don't have big, uh, big tools and big devices, it's really uh, counting. It's, it's somebody looking at the, um, the number of breaths and counting the number of breaths over a course of a minute or so. 
it leads to all kinds of um, errors. You, you miscount. So when we came together with Philips and they suggested, they thought they could have perhaps a solution for this. So we were really excited to work with them in developing uh, a, a, a device, the charm device, which is very simple, and it had to have a number of key criteria. Um, of course, it had to work for the purpose, which is to be able to... It's 14 hours. Properly diagnose pneumonia. Um, it had to work in low-resource settings. It had to be able to utilize, be utilized by um, frontline health workers who have all different levels of education. Some will be very well educated. Some may have only gone to, like, third grade. Um, and it should not require a lot of training. So the charm device is a very simple device that is applied on the baby's or the toddler's chest. Uh, it quickly uh, and automatically counts the number of breaths and provides a very simple color-coded response to tell you if that child in front of you has pneumonia or not and should they then start getting antibiotics and be referred to other places. Um, we are really excited. In 2016, we did a, a pilot, which was really all about trying it out, measuring results, see whether it's working. Is it better, at, more efficient at diagnosing pneumonia than a trained physician? Uh, the results were very positive, so we're extremely excited. We're now working on what's the second round of this tool. Uh, what else do we want to tweak or add to it? And we're hoping in 2018 to have the second round of testing now in Malawi. And I do want to mention this try and try again, because for any of you, whether you are in the nonprofit side or on the corporate side, if you're thinking of entering a shared value partnership, it is really important that you keep in mind that it's not going to be your quick and easy partnership, where you go with a clear objective and you expect exactly certain results at the end of the grant. This is a journey you're going to enter together. And you need to be prepared that things may not quite work out as you planned. You may need to redesign or tweak and try again. And so I would say be prepared for the long run and make sure you have buy-in across all levels of the organization. Because when the first try, maybe it's not quite as straightforward as you thought, it would be very easy to walk away. So you really need the buy-in, so you will stay for the run. Uh, but if it does work, the results at the end can be phenomenal. Um, and so Charles is going to tell you about one other example. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Luciana. So, so the other example which one really wanted to talk about uh, was more of a multi-sector and a multi-country approach, uh, an approach that we're trying out in India with an organization uh, called RICO. I'm sure all of you are aware it's a multinational which works in electronics and digital imaging solutions. And uh, what we really did with them was that uh, RICO came to us saying that they their, their, their goal was to look at technology in education, and that could be as simple as you make it out to be or as complex. Um, so what we really identified was that what were the needs in uh, education in India? Um, so the biggest factor uh, in education in India is not that the children are not going to school. Uh, the government has a very strong policy on sending children to school. But while children are there in school, they are not learning. That is a bigger, cha big, bigger challenge for India. A grade five student in the school, in a government school in India, cannot read and write at the levels of a grade two in a private school in India. And why that's really happening is that the teaching learning environment in classrooms is, is, is not fun. It's not interactive. Uh, teachers are just using the regular old textbook methodology. Spaces are very cramped. Infrastructure is not there. Uh, even if you do want to try out any um, information communication technology approaches, uh, there are no computers. There are no functioning machinery around it. Um, so we really worked with RICO to develop some sort of a solution to this problem. And what we really arrived at is that you know, RICO really dug deep from its archives. And there is this ultra, uh, there's this short ultra throw projector that they have, which can be used in classroom situations like this. So imagine a classroom which is about 20 by 20 feet, where children are really huddled up together. If you use a projector like this, uh, there won't be any space. You possibly will just 
be seeing the wall. So they came up with this projector, which you can actually place against the wall, and it can project upwards, and the lessons can be delivered. Now, the other problem which we were facing was the schools did not have computers. So uh, Rico helped us in digitizing the curriculum, which was already there for grade three to grade five, put it on a pen stick, and that could be directly connected to the projector. So you don't need a computer. So uh, that, that's an innovation which really helped in uh, situations, uh, school situations in India. And RICO not only developed this capability on its own, but also approached the Japanese International Cooperation Agency, JICA, to get more funding for this. Um, and what really, really worked in terms of the impact and achievement was we did this for over three years in a state called Telangana in India. And um, the government really loved this model. And while we started off with only 30 schools, the government came to us and said that we would like to replicate in all schools in Telangana. So that's what we are doing now as a next phase. And uh, we've seen the learning levels of children increase and improve from 60% to 90% over the last three years. And teachers really excited about this and using their own materials and developing that. And um, I'm just going to end with, the vid with a video which really will bring alive this whole story. Uh, the only caveat to this is, are there any Japanese in the room? OK, so then there's, it's time to brush up your Japanese, because the video is in Japanese. But we do have English subtitles. <laughs> just cutting it short in the interest of time. Just wanted to leave you with the last story. I was actually visiting one of these schools last week in India. And I was talking to a girl, a girl with a twinkle in, his, in her eyes, and asking her how this has really helped her. And what, what does she think she would want to do in the future in terms of her career aspirations, a grade five. And I'm going to say this in Hindi and then convert it into English. So she said, Humne aaj class mein video pe Brahman ke baare mein sikha. Aur aapko pata hai ki Brahman hamesha phelta rehta hai, hamesha badta rehta hai. Uski koi seema nahi hai. Mujhe Brahman banna hai. So that's what, um, if, if I really convert into English, saying that we learned about the universe today. And do you know that the universe is constantly expanding? I want to be the universe.